two, three, all eyes on me. <laughs> Just like start whispering, if you can hear me, touch your nose. If you can hear me, touch your ears. <laughs> All right, that's good. All right, family, come on, let's get settled in. Troops, assemble. All right. Well, good morning, Life Point. Yeah. All right. We can do better. I do. One more time. Good morning, Life Point. Good morning. All right. Whew. Goodness gracious. Goodness. It's a good morning, though. I don't know about you guys, but I'm excited. Um, every day is a day that the Lord has made. And I have a couple announcements this morning. Well, actually a handful, to be honest. Um, we have a new soul that has joined us on the earth, a baby, uh, little Brave and Koa Stanford. Miles and Nicole, they had just another beautiful baby, and he was their smallest, but he's healthy. That really matters. And so, yes, we're in love. Seven pounds is not a small child, but for them it has been. <laughs> um, yes, so congrats to Miles and Nicole. Um, there is, I think, a, are we doing a, a meal train type thing? Um, or are we figuring out a way to, to bless them? Um, we'll have to get with Cassie on that, but either way. Um, no service or events this Wednesday except a uh, youth group. So if you are your children go to youth, just know that that is still happening here Wednesday at 6.30. But at Suzanne's house, okay, not here. Thank you, Sarah Ann. And that is not here. So, yes, driving down the street at, at Miss Suzanne's house. And uh, there will be, we'll have, just text us, let us know. We can get you directions to Philip, uh, Philip's mom's home. And uh, they'll have a good time there. Um, there's also Miss, um, here we go, Miss Susan Green is doing heart healing on Zoom September 12th. Now, can we get some more? Yeah, that's hard to read, though. <laughs> yeah. Thursday, September 12th, 7 p.m., sessions will be available on Zoom, replays available as well. And there is the email. And Miss Susan, are you here? Okay, right there with her, her hand up. If you are interested, please reach out and connect with her, and you can get involved with her and heart healing ministry. All right. We also have a work day, September 28th. Oh, that was not good. <laughs> we need to do better for sure. Um, it, they, we call it fun, uh, fun work day, which it is because... You know, I don't know about you guys, but I'm rewarded every time I do my work unto the Lord. And that's either scrubbing the floor, a toilet, straightening the chairs. When your heart posture changes, no matter what you're doing, if you're doing it unto God, you are rewarded for it. Even the small things, genuinely. Um, ladies retreat, October 25th through the 27th. Um, where is Miss Janet? There she is, purple blouse. Woo -woo! We love you. Um, get with Miss Janet if you need information on um, this women's retreat. It's supposed to be a big, big deal. Going to be a lot of fun. Going to be a, a good time for for fellowship with the ladies. Um, there's more information. Obviously, she's done two weeks of kind of like letting us, giving us some some information on it. Just connect with her if you're interested in going, or um, Amy Wells is involved, and Miss Karen. Um, so, yes, either of the three are involved in helping uh, have that, host it, and, and uh, facilitate. It's going to be a big fun. 
ladies, I would strongly encourage you to join. It's going to be, it's going to be great. Um, small groups are resuming this week. You can check them out. Um, the men's group that's 18 plus, and that's 18 plus. So doesn't matter how old you are, you're welcome. Um, it starts again on Tuesday evening at seven o'clock here in the sanctuary, and the renewed tribe. Ladies group is resuming as well Tuesday, and they meet in the annex, which is the building right behind the main sanctuary. All right. I think I got them all done. So. Now, without being argumentative over particular words, because that is my nature, I want to say that I know that we can sing songs and, and we can say certain things like, Lord, be with me. Holy Spirit, come. Lord, you know, sh walk in the room. I, I've always struggled with those things personally because I personally believe the Lord has never left me. And so songs like that, and this is not a dig at you, Sydney, this is just in general, because we'll say certain things or we believe certain things that can almost frustrate or limit God in your moment, in your day-to-day -day activities. That, Lord, you said you would never leave me and never forsake me. You dwell in me and you're always around me. So to ask you to be with me is counterproductive. You've already said you were with me. You've promised fellowship with me. Now, I understand the heart behind it, and I think there's a good declarative power in saying, Holy Spirit, come. Lord, be with me. Those things, it's okay, right? I'm not saying you can't do that. But what I am saying is that make sure in your mind and in your heart you know the Lord is never going to leave you, and he is never not with you in your deepest place because if you're asking God to be with you when you're struggling you don't know that he's probably already carrying you mm. I'm serious I'm serious the last year has been the hardest year for me personally and yeah I feel like it's been a little bit like footsteps in the sand I know it seems corny and if any of you guys have ever seen it it's like why are there only one set of footsteps right here Lord and there was two back here he's like well this is where I started carrying you mm -hmm. some of you need to know you're being carried by God not against your will but you asked and so he picked you up mm -hmm. it says that he is faithful when we are not so enjoy that faithfulness um, this is not an encouragement to just Lord, I'm going to jump in your arms and you can do the rest. Like, no, 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 no. But I wanted to read Psalm 24, okay? And it goes along with one of the songs you're singing this morning. And it says, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who will ascend the hill of the Lord? And who will stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false or idols, and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness. And such is the righteousness of those who seek him, who seek the face of God, the God of Jacob. Here's where it gets fiery inside of David's heart. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Now, the word coming in here for me is, Lord, you're going to manifest yourself here amongst us. You're going to reveal yourself to us in a way we've never seen you in the coming days, weeks, and months, right? Without getting too loud and too boisterous, there is a belief and a faith in the fact that the Lord has more to reveal to us, even now. Not against his nature. But I know that you need a miracle. 
We all need miracles. We all need a move of God in, through, and around us every day. And right now, the Lord's more willing to do it. Not more willing, but He is willing and able mm -hmm. to do exceedingly abundantly above and beyond anything we could ever ask or th thank. Finish it for me. The expectancy has gone up this morning. Let's fight to stay there. Because it's not just for us, it's for the ones that we're around every day. I know, I can see this light coming out of the hand of God's body on the earth to touch those around us. Everywhere you are. What was it, Nick, this morning? We must be about our Father's business. Even at the age of 12, he was about his Father's business. Father, we're about your business this morning. We love you. Receive this praise. Lord, if there's anything that's getting in the way, any area where we're not pure in our heart, we ask that you would just expose it to us, purify us, so that we can ascend that hill, Lord. With clean hands and pure hearts, we worship you, and we offer up our best to you.
one on the throne Jesus holy he is worthy of praise honor glory there is one on
place for you, you to be glorified, you to be lifted high. All I want is for you, you to be glorified, you to be lifted high. All I really want is for you, you to be glorified, you to be lifted high. All I want is for you, you to be glorified, you to be lifted Jesus, we magnify you. We just take our energy this morning, Lord, and we focus on you and we give you glory. We magnify you and glorify your name. You are our King of kings. We declare your goodness, your favor are on your people. You are our God. Lord, we do worship, we honor you. We give you <clears throat> the place that you deserve in our lives and in our service and everything that we do. Lord, we bless you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to Life Point, everybody. Great to see you. Great to see familiar faces and not so familiar faces. It's great to have you and trust that you're having a good time with us. More than a good time being blessed by our time of worship and we believe during the time of the word being shared as well that God would touch your life. Uh, it's always my heart <clears throat> that uh, we don't just have a service to have a service. We don't just do church to do church but that something happens. And I believe if we come with an expectation to receive something from the Lord, we will receive something in spite of the speaker. <clears throat> Amen. Well, um, it's great to be together. And uh, I looked at the weather report, shouldn't do that kind of stuff, but because we're at that time of the year where you kind of think, 
when? <laughs> it's about a week out. I started seeing temperatures dip a little bit, and I thought, uh-oh. <clears throat> we'll see what happens. Weathermen have been known to be wrong on the very day that they predict the weather. So there you go. Uh, years ago, um, I was on a trip in the southern part of Mexico and had some free time between meetings and usually if there's something to do, I try to do it, especially if it's a, a place I've never been before. I like to see things and I'm not a tourist type and not just a sightseer, but I'm also not one to sit around in a hotel room and do nothing. I want to get to know the place and even history and things like that. So this one place I was in, <coughs> they had a uh, ecological, uh, like a little mini tour in part of what they called the jungle that they had in that area, which was very vegetated, very green, very, very full with all kinds of fauna, all kinds of animals, all kinds of plant life. And so I went on this <coughs> little walking tour into the jungle and of course you know they give you a little bit of warnings about this and that and some people are freaking out and I figure well I can run faster than them so it's not a problem <laughs> but we go into this tour and they had what they call uh, they had monkeys but they call them howlers so they, they, they make this howling sound when they see somebody or see anything going on and they, they communicate that way, that's kind of like to scare you off. So the guy that was taking us through there, we could hear him, and he said, look, there they are. So we look up through the trees, and we could see these monkeys up there howling. But there were a group of people in our, in our trip. There's always one that makes it, ruins it for everybody. And they were there, and they said, where are they? And the guide said, look up there. He said, I can't see them. Where? where? I can't see them. And they kept screaming, screaming to the point that it just ruined the experience of watching these monkeys, right? Because they could never see the monkeys for the trees. And the problem wasn't that the monkeys weren't there. The problem was that their focus was on the wrong thing. And they never got to experience that part of the tour, right? Like, they're right there. Just look. Let's get closer. J just look up there. They're right there. They could never see them. They just couldn't identify them through the trees and through everything else that was there. The way we are in life, many times, is we cannot see what's right in front of us because of everything else we're seeing. And we need, and what I want to talk to you this morning about, is we need God to open our eyes to see. We need God to open our eyes to see. Uh, it's a very simple, if you will, very foundational for me, a foundational word, simple word, but it's what God put on my heart that I would just speak to you about this a little bit, and then we would pray for your eyes to be open. And some might say, well, I've, I've got open eyes. You may have for some things. You may have, may not have for other things. Uh, I've found that uh, through life <clears throat> that uh, we're blind in some area or other until God opens our eyes to see that area, you will never see it. Uh, it's the same when you talk about craziness is doing the same thing you've always done, expecting a different result. Because we can't see. Have you ever sat with someone and said, if you'll just do this, don't just ignore everything else, just do this, but I've never done it that way. Okay, do it now. Just do this. Turn a blind eye to what you've always done and change your focus to something different and see what will happen. I can remember years ago listening to this guy just, you know, trying to, I've always, always looked at 
studying things. I love to study. I love to learn new things. I love to delve outside of my areas of expertise, if you will, and learn other things. And I can remember he was giving all these principles and talking about it. And what he would say a lot of times, because most people would never do that, what he was saying, he would say, uh, how, would he, how would he put it? He'd, put, he'd say, trust me now, believe me later. <clears throat> trust me now, believe me later. Trust what I'm telling you and do it, even though you don't believe it works. And later when you see the results, you will believe me. Now, I believe God does that to us all the time. He basically is saying to us, and Jesus is saying, obey my word, and it's not the results first, it's the obedience first. And, and I found so many times the areas of my life where I am blind, when I can see it in the word of God, even though everything in me cries out and says, no way. It is amazing how those things will work. And then you look back and you say, how come I never saw that? Why didn't I do that before? So anyway, I want to just speak along those lines a little bit because I believe there's something about seeing. How many times have you uh, done things? I was just talking with someone that's an expert as a plumber, Steve Green, who's sitting back there. And there's, things, there's two things that I don't like to do. I don't like to do plumbing, and I don't like to do electricity. Electricity because I'm afraid of dying. <laughs> and plumbing because I don't want an eternal leak that I can't fix. Right? <laughs> so I want to know. So I went to the expert, and I said, I've got this situation that I need to do in the kitchen, and I, this is what I'm thinking, but I don't know if it'll work. And he said, send me a picture, because he'll look at it and tell me. But the problem with the whole situation is not what Steve tells me. The problem is I can't see it. I can't, if I can't see the solution, I can't work towards it. If he'll give me a seeing picture, like even if he explains it and in my mind, now I can see, ah, I see it. Then I can do it. Now, I don't know about anybody else in the room. Not all of us are built the same way. I am, if you will, a seer. I need to see it. Like if I'm going to build a house, show me the plans, and I will visualize the house in order to build it. I don't just go off a set of plans. I look at the plans and say, okay, this is the way the finished product will look. Sometimes we can't see the finished product. And it's important for us to improve our vision in all areas. But, you know, how many times we just, people talking to us and, oh, I see it now. I, I understand. Right? We get that aha moment. I can see it. And we use that phraseology of seeing. Because there's something about our eyes being able to capture what is going on versus even just hearing. Hearing is important. Job even put it this way because Job went through his life. He had all kinds of situations. And <clears throat> from the beginning of the book of Job, you know, he got into a lot of trouble. And we won't go into that whole story. But lost everything. And then he had three friends that were questionable, <laughs> questionable friends in his life. We all have those. We all have people that know more than we do. And the truth is, they probably do know more. But we get into all this arguing back and forth, and, and that's the discussion in the book of Job. It's one of those books that you hate or love. So I usually read the beginning and the end and skip the rest. <clears throat> I read it just to say I have read it. <clears throat> but when you come towards the end of the book, after all these arguments and all these discussions happen, 
there is the presence of God. He's been listening in on all of this going on. And the Lord actually says pretty much, and I'm going to paraphrase because it's just, it's my story right now. But God pretty much says, shut up. It's my turn to talk. I've let you all talk all you want. You've said your piece. You've said all that you think. You've given all your opinions. You've given all your ideas. Now it's my turn. And he starts out and God begins to declare. He says, I am God. I'm the one that put the limits to the ocean. I'm the one that made the mountains. I'm the one that created. I'm the one that set the stars in motion. I'm the one that put the moon up there. I'm the one that put the planets up there. I'm the one that did all these. How dare you talk to me not understanding that I am God <clears throat> and trying to figure out everything about me without knowing who I am. Now, that's not in Job. That latter part is me. But that's pretty much what God is saying. Said, and he's done this. God does this throughout the Old Testament. Many times he'll come to a place where he says, I am God. I, I speak. I declare the beginning. I, I, I declare the end from the beginning. Things that are not as though they are. Um, he goes on and on. So <clears throat> after God gives his discourse and he puts everybody in their place, it's interesting that all the other guys shut up after that. Job responds. And one thing that Job says, it's always very much ministered to my spirit, very deeply to the inside of me, is Job says, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear. Throughout my life, I've heard you, God. I've heard your voice. I've heard your word. I've heard you. But now... My eye sees you. There was a transition that took place in Job's life from the hearing of the ear to the seeing of the eye. And that transition is a transition that God wants for every one of his children. It is great, and it starts with hearing, and we need to hear. And I could preach on hearing and the importance of hearing, and <clears throat> we can make a case why hearing is the most important thing. But I'm telling you, in the Word of God, there is a transition, and we'll see it as we go through the Word of God. There is a transitioning from over time hearing God, and then all of a sudden, it's like an aha moment. I see. And have you heard, you can't unsee what you've seen? That's, a, I think, a very strong truth. You can't unsee, I can't unsee that. <clears throat> Romans tells us, Romans 10, 17 says, says faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So we know hearing is important. And hearing is where we all start. And without going into a lot of foundational things, I will say to everyone listening, every person, not just Christians, have the capacity to hear God. Too many times we think, oh, non-Christians can't hear God. <laughs> really? How do you think they get to God? Christians and non-Christians, I mean, we, we've got to stop this game. Sometimes we put ourselves on a pedestal to where, I mean, do you, do you understand what we're saying? I can remember as a kid, my mother was very religious. She heard God. She wasn't saved in our vernacular. She was religious, but she heard God. I can remember one time my mom saying, don't go in the water today. I told her, Mom, I'm going, I'm going scuba diving. 
off the coast of the Atlantic coast. I think I was 16. And my mom says, I had a dream last night. Don't go in the water. I saw all these things coming out of the water and biting. Mom, I'm going diving. <clears throat> Just ignored it. Went to the beach, got our equipment all out on the sand, and we're looking at the water, and they had the warning signs. They had man of wars were all over the place. I looked at my buddies. I ain't going. <laughs> I'm not going to tempt the thing. I'm, I'm not going. I mean, if this lady who I love, my mom, is saying crazy stuff, but then I get to the ocean and it's like, what crazy is now reality, I ain't getting in. Because sure enough, I'm going to get bit, stung, whatever you want to call it. <clears throat> People, God has created mankind to hear his voice. And that gets clear over time. And if I was to be very honest with you, there are a lot of born-again believers that their hearing is very dull, as well as the eyesight being very dim. Don't take it. It's not a slant. It's not a... Uh, it's, it's, I'm just telling you reality. Um, <clears throat> Paul was very religious. And Paul, and I'm going to read this about Paul. Paul was a, a Pharisee of Pharisees. <clears throat> and Paul, um, you know, if we, if we follow a little bit of his timeline, Paul, as a Pharisee of Pharisee, got into a place where he was there at the stoning of Stephen. He was a participant, not a on, on viewer. Paul, they put their cloaks at his feet, which means Paul gave consent and was waiting there, standing there for Stephen to be stoned. You got to think about that and digest that a little bit. Paul was against the people of the way, the people that proclaimed Jesus was Lord. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. And he thought totally different. He had studied scripture. He was, he was renowned in all that he knew, studied under the best teachers. And Paul gets letters from the Sanhedrin, which was the ruling religious council of the Jewish people. They give him letters with authority to travel to Damascus and to stop the people that are in the way the way in quotes, being Christian, believing and looking to Jesus Christ as Lord. So Paul, on his journey, along with other men, as he's going along, something takes place. And something from heaven strikes Paul, and a light hits him, and it surrounds him, and these other guys are standing there in the midst of what's going on. Paul is the only one getting all of this. They're hearing something. They don't really know what's going on. But it's interesting if you watch the story, Paul's the only one that gets converted from this story. So verse 7, it says, The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. I don't know about you, but I probably wouldn't eat or drink anything either. If a light just hit me and I was blinded from a light from heaven, and someone out of that light talked to me that I couldn't see, and began to speak to him things that, crazy stuff, like, what are you doing, Paul? What, 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 what are you doing, Saul, at that time? And Saul said, I, I, don't, I don't even know who you are. You're, you're coming against me, and, and, and you got to stop this, pretty much is what God says. 
So God blinds him. Now here's the interesting thing, and I want to mention this. Paul was blind before he got blinded. Okay? So many times we are blind and ignorant of being blind. Okay. For three days he was blind, did not eat, drink. Verse 10, in Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. When you don't know what to do, it's a good thing to pray. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on his name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how, he much, he, how much he must suffer for my name. <clears throat> then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, the interesting thing in all of this is Ananias was scared to death to go see Saul. <clears throat> and God speaking to him, and clearly by the word of God, it's almost maybe audible, but close enough to understand that Ananias knows he's hearing the voice of God. And Ananias is threatened by this situation. And the first thing he says to the Lord, he says, this guy is the same guy that's been persecuting I mean, he had Stephen killed. He's been doing other things, putting people in prison. He's been doing all kinds of stuff. What, what if he arrests me? What if, what if this happens? What, I mean, can you imagine this stuff going through his mind? But the key in what God was saying to Ananias was, Ananias, he is praying. He's bending his knee. He's praying. Something's changed. God was letting him know something was going on. And a lot of times in life, I think when we don't know what else to do, the best thing to do is drop a knee. You know, we, we are, and I'll just go off a second on this. We are very good about doing all kinds of actions without prayer. When prayer is mightier than the sword. Prayer is more effective than anything else we can imagine. I'm the type, and a lot of you in this room are this type, is if it's broken, I can fix it. Nobody else in the room. <laughs> Thank you. Not a problem. We can fix that. God's saying, I don't need you to fix it. I need you to pray. I would love to fix you. Come on. You know I've had the desire. <laughs> we all need fixing, I included. But you understand where I'm coming from. If they would just, if they would just, if they could just do this, if they could just change this. <clears throat> and the Lord has told me over and over again, do not put your hand in that. You pray. <clears throat> and it's been amazing how God answers prayer and works through prayer. Uh, even with my own children, so many times I've, I, I've wanted things to happen with my kids. And if, 
If I had my way, let's just be honest. If I had my way, I would have dictated everything that my children need to do. <clears throat> are you there? It's like, these are the decisions you need to make. This is what you need to do. This is what you need to eat. This is where you need to live. Thank God I heard from the Lord and took my hands off. To be a true father, we nurture, we don't control. <clears throat> but you get where I'm coming from. Ananias is listening to the voice of God, and God says, he's praying. I want you to go and do this. So Ananias goes there. He's received by Paul. Paul does not reject him. And, of course, he sees Paul's blind. God had showed this to him. And he prays for him. And in verse 18, immediately, immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes. And he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. Now, <clears throat> when Paul was prayed for by <clears throat> Ananias, it says something like scales fell off of his eyes. That was an aha moment for Paul. Something like scales. So many times we don't realize what's going on spiritually because we're blind to it. Something like scales is over our eyes. And, of course, we can blame that and say, well, that's just demonic. Maybe it's not. Maybe it's ignorance. Maybe it's not wanting to see. Maybe it's selfishness. Maybe it's pride. Well, I'll tell you something. Pride has stopped me from seeing a lot of things. Maybe the building of the scales, you know how uh, if your water is not the correct type of water, you got to put softeners in it and all this stuff so it doesn't clog up the pipes. Maybe we're building the scales because of our lack of seeing, because of wrong decisions over and over again. Hope I'm not meddling too much. God wants to remove the scales. And I know, you know, all this stuff comes up. Well, I mean, I'm a born-again believer. I love God. I don't have any scales. Wrong. You can, you can battle me on that. You can argue with me all you want. I've lived long enough to know that scales are on Christians' eyes. There are so many, I mean, I'll, I'll settle it with this. How many denominations are there? <laughs> Argument settled. I mean, I'm being truthful. <clears throat> Christians can't even get along with each other. Because we're so adamant and dogmatic about some things that we believe that we will never look at in a different way. You're blind in an area. And I'm talking to us. I'm not talking to them. I'm talking to us. I've gone into situations where it's been way outside my box. And I've seen God doing things. And I said, God, I don't think you're in this. But because you said... I'm going to give you an opportunity to speak to me. Open my eyes to see what I can't see. And sometimes God will need to use a donkey <laughs> because our eyes are not opened. I'm referring to Balaam. Do we have scales on our eyes? Do we have clarity spiritually? I don't think just the prayer today is going to take care of it fully, but I believe it's a great start. 
I believe it's a great moment to recognize and say, God, whatever scales are on my eyes, remove them. I want to see. I want to see more than I can ever see. Um, <clears throat> Mark eight twenty two says this. It's a story about a healing that takes place with Jesus. <clears throat> They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? Now, first of all, it's always amazing that Jesus could spit, take dirt, and this guy was in such need that he allowed him to put spit on his face. Today, something like that takes place, and our first reaction is, this is a cult. I'm getting out of here. Do you hear what I'm saying? We judge so many things, and God does things in such a different way than we would ever do them. So he says, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Now, this is Jesus, remember, the Son of God, praying for this man. And he didn't receive full healing. He didn't receive full sight. Which begs the question, maybe there's a process that God takes us through to get our sight back fully. Maybe it's not a one-time deal. Maybe there's a bit of a process as we're walking with the Lord and getting closer to Him that He is constantly more and more opening our eyes to see what we cannot see. There's a lot of things that I see today that I didn't see 20 years ago. There's a lot of things that I can't live in regret over, but I can live in repentance over. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened. His sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't even go into the village. Of course, that's another part, but he went from partially seeing to seeing clearly. I love a little story in John. I think a lot of times it's overlooked because it's just a small little couple verses. And we don't think much about it. But in the book of John 12, verse 20, it says, Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. Some Greeks. They weren't Jewish. How many understand? That's outside of... The norm. They're in Jerusalem. They were Greeks. So they probably have been proselyted. They became Jewish, but not by birth. So there's some Greeks that went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida, in Galilee with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. They made a request, and I've always been amazed at that request. Sir, we would see Jesus. I want to see this man. And I love that they weren't denied access to see him. And I guess what I'm saying this morning is, can we pray that prayer? God, we would see Jesus. In the year that King Uzziah 
passed away. Isaiah chapter 6, which is maybe out of order chronologically to the book historically. Isaiah chapter 6 is where the call of God comes on Isaiah. His cousin, he was related to the king. Uzziah was one of the greatest benevolent kings that Israel ever had. And Israel had a rocky road. They had more bad kings than good kings. There were a few, you know, like Josiah, that brought back the scrolls and brought the nation into repentance and, and, and brought that back to the Jewish people. There were a few, like Uzziah, that there was peace during his reign, and he was a good king, and he sought the Lord. So Isaiah, his cousin, passes away. This marks a historical, you could say an historical upheaval in the nation. Because the next king is not going to be like this one was. Isaiah knew that, but at the same time, Isaiah knew that peace had reigned, and this was his cousin, and this was a loved man in his life. So you got to imagine grief was happening. you got to imagine he was going through a low point in his own life, having to deal with what just took place, and it's of mention in the Bible, which means it's important to the story. Otherwise, God wouldn't have mentioned it. But it's mentioned in there, in the year King Uzziah died, right? <clears throat> and the very next phrase says, is everybody looking at it? I saw the Lord. I saw the Lord high and exalted. I want you to be thinking as you're hearing this about the state of emotion, the state of mind that Isaiah would have been in. He was in a moment of grief. He was in a moment of history being changed. He was in a moment of what do we do. He was in a moment of where is God. And all this is running through his emotional being, through his mind. And he sees the Lord. And we sing this as a song. We look at it. But I don't know how many times we actually just sit there and look at what's really going on. And Isaiah says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And I'll ask you a question as we're reading this. How do you see the Lord? I saw the Lord high and lifted up, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, with two they covered their feet, and with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of of his glory. These are the angels calling out. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. The whole earth is full of his glory. This is what Isaiah is seeing. I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And I'm calling you this morning to see the Lord higher than you've ever seen him. I'm bringing you to a place this morning as we pray into this that God would open our eyes to see God in his splendor <coughs> and not see our difficulty or see our earthly origins. I'm calling us to look up and see the one that is mighty, see the one that is lofty, see the one that is above all things no matter what's going on in your life, no matter what's going on around you, that he is higher than that, and you can see him on the throne, not just of your life, but of the world. 
I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Seated on the throne, his train, his robe, filled the temple. <coughs> Above him were seraphim, each with six wings, with two wings that covered their face, two covered their feet, two they were flying. They were calling, holy, holy, holy. Is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. <clears throat> At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. That wasn't one of those machines, by the way. Okay? That wasn't one of those, you hear it, you can hear it going, shh, shh. I've been in churches where all of a sudden I hear this hissing sound. I'm thinking, what, what's going on? And all of a sudden, there's a cloud. And the worship team comes up into the cloud. And it's like, I don't know how to tell you this, but that don't make you more holy. It just makes it harder to see. <laughs> Trying to use theatrics to hide. You can't do the stuff you think you can do. So the smoke covers it up. Come on. <clears throat> the whole temple filled with smoke. I've, I've actually witnessed that with my eyes open. This is, this is not a game. The first time I was in a situation where, I mean, I was looking, I, I, I mean, I was running from God and at the same time trying to, God, if you're real, I need you to be real and not... Not this God that I've just heard talked about. I need you to be a God that's real in my life. <clears throat> and I can remember we went to a place with this man of God. He came into this little trailer where we were, we were at with this a friend of mine. His son had, was sick and he had this big ball on his neck that had popped out from being sick. It went into a gland and the gland popped out like a balloon. And they'd been to doctors and the doctors did antibiotics, did all that stuff. You can only do so much antibiotics before your body rejects it. And nothing would change. And then I heard, I won't go into all the details, but I heard from a man of God that was related to my friend. And that man said, guys, come down here. It was pretty much saying, come and see. And I'm all about come and see. When I see a burning bush, I go after it. When there's a burning bush that won't be consumed, I go find out what's going on. We piled into the car, went down there all together, two families, three families, all of us. We get down there, and this man of God comes to, to pray. He's, and this, this grandfather said, this man has gifts of healing. Wow, that's in the Bible. I want to see that. Sounds like this, I mean, this is, I've never heard someone say they have a gift of healing. That's kind of cool, because in a lot of atmospheres, we just don't talk about supernatural stuff. We, we put God on such a, a natural plane that there is no supernatural God in our walk anymore. Come on. Think about what I'm saying. I don't know about you, but I'm hungry for a supernatural God. I don't need what this world has to give me. I can't live on the natural stuff. I need the real deal. Because this life's going to end at some point. And he walked in there and sat down and kind of crossed his hands and <clears throat> said, let's pray. He wasn't messing around. He didn't want small talk. He didn't care who we were. Maybe he did, but at the time, all I saw was this man is... He's so focused on God. I thought, God, whatever's going on here, I don't know what it is, but there's something that my hunger is going through the roof right now. And he prayed, and as he prayed, the room filled with a cloud of smoke. Now, I was the only one who saw it. My wife was there. She didn't see the cloud. But God was doing something for me and in me. And I saw a cloud. My eyes were wide open, and I saw a cloud. I even talked years later to that man that did the prayer. And I said, did you see that cloud? I mean, I, it took me years to ask him. I didn't have the nerve. I said, did you see the cloud? He said, I didn't see any cloud. 
Of course, he's told me stories where angels have gone into cities and visited people and told them that he was coming to town. He never saw the angels, but angels visited people. And people would come out to a revival meeting because the angel visited and said, a man, this white man's coming. When I say white, I'm talking about white. Like no tan. <clears throat> I saw that cloud. And I heard a voice. And my eyes were open because the voice said to me, he's healed. And I didn't see anything change. We didn't see anything change. But I understood something. I didn't understand it for years later because I couldn't put words to it. You know, there's a lot of things you're going to experience in God that you'll never be able to put words to. Stop trying to figure it out. Just enjoy what God gave you. I mean, there's going to be theologians and smarter people come along and say, well, this is that. Well, just leave me alone. I don't need to know. I don't need, it's, it's under this gift, it's under this category. What if it's just God? But I remember God spoke to me and I heard his voice. And his voice said, the boy is healed now. And I felt inside of me a faith that I had never experienced before. I understood it years later. It was a gift of faith. It was faith in something that my eyes could not see yet, but my spiritual eyes saw. It was something that my natural man could not conceive, but inside me everything yelled and screamed and said, the opposite of what you see has just taken place. Within three days, that thing popped, I think, the first day. Within three days, it drained on its own, shriveled up, and fell off of his neck. I didn't go around jumping around. Wow, I saw something. No, I was just glad the boy was healed. But what I did experience was that I saw into the spiritual realm something I'd never seen before. And <clears throat> I started this off by telling you something. Once you've seen something, you can't go back. You can't unsee stuff that you've seen. And I may be getting off track just a little bit, but just bear with my insanity. We need to keep asking. We need to keep believing what we're hearing until God opens our seeing. We need to keep going. I could go on and on. I could give you testimony even of recent, recent weeks, recent time. I've, I don't know about anybody else in the room. Anybody else in the room been tired? I don't ever make this kind of confession, but I'm just doing it right now. I guess I'm on a roll. It's just, I've, it's been a long summer. It's been tiring. There's been a lot going on. And there have been a lot of spiritual attacks trying to quelch the people of God. Because I believe that something's coming. I believe something's coming. But I'm telling you, it's been a season of fighting. And it's not over. I'm not telling you to stop fighting. It's been a season of pressing in. It's been a season, season of believing what you have stopped believing. I've seen things in just the last week that my wife and I have prayed for years and years. And we have seen the hand of God orchestrating and the answer coming. It's not 100%, but it's more than 50. It's close enough to call it. Are you there? It's like I could just, oh, well, that's done. No, no, no. I'm praying harder. Because the enemy is not going to steal what God has started manifesting. Manifesting. 
And I can see it. I can see it. I've heard it, but now I can see it. Because when you start seeing the manifestation of God in a situation, your eyes get opened. All right, there's a lot more I could probably say. I want to pray for you. Get ready. Because I believe this is a power moment. And, and, and I want you to receive this because I just want you to get ready because God's going to do something. I'm going to say God's going to do something for you in spite of you. Okay? And, and I'm believing this to be a prayer that will bring breakthrough. And I'm believing that this to be a prayer where Jesus laid his hands on that blind man and his eyes started seeing, not clearly, but then he prayed the second time and he started seeing clearly. So I might repeat. But I want you to get in a stance. I want you to get your heart ready. And I, want, I, I feel like this inside of me. My heart is screaming, even though you can't hear the words coming out. My heart is screaming, saying, God, open my eyes. I want to see what I haven't been able to see. I want to see further than I've ever saw. Lord, let me see into the supernatural, what I've not been able to see. So right now, I come against, as a son of God, with authority from heaven, declared authority over my life, Lord, that you love me as your son, and you have called me. And Lord, I stand in that place of honor, and I stand in that place of privilege that you have given me as your child. And I speak against all spiritual blindness. And I command it like scales to fall off of the eyes of God's people. And in Jesus' name right now, in that authority, in the authority of heaven, in the authority of the blood of Jesus, in the authority of the crucified body of Jesus and resurrected power of Christ, I declare vision over the people of God. I declare open eyes, open vision to see what they have not been able to see. And I am declaring that what they've been hearing will become visible and manifest in their life, even in the next days. Not in the next century, not in the next 10 years, but Lord, that you will shower. Even as Isaiah declared, I saw him high and lifted up, and the angels singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Lord, we are your temple. Fill your temple with your glory. Fill this temple with your presence. Fill this temple with who you are. Lord, let things break off right now. And Lord, we just shake it off of our life. We shake off spiritual blindness. We, spirit, we shake off spiritual deafness. We shake off the things that have stopped us from seeing. We shake off the things that have stopped us from moving forward. And we declare today to be a day where you heal our vision and you give us a sight to see beyond we could ever imagine. Eye has not seen. Ear has not heard. Neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. And Lord, I thank you right now that we do have eyes to see. And we have ears to hear. And Lord, you do fill our hearts with your desires, with your wanting in our life. Jesus, come. Let every scale fall in Jesus' name. Open the eyes of the blind. Open our eyes to see what we cannot see. Lord, we even declare right now, we just take our stuff, what we don't know, what we ignore, we just take it and lay it before you and we say, God, 
We've tried things for a long time. Show us a new way. Speak to us, Lord, and we'll be obedient to hear. Lord, even if it goes against what we've always done, Lord, speak to us and open our eyes to see what is it that you want? How are we to walk? In the name of Jesus. Lord, let your power come down right now. Wind of the Spirit of God blow in this place. Wind of the Spirit of God blow in this place. Blow, Spirit of God. Take stuff out. Deposit new. In Jesus' name. I can hear that song in my spirit. I hear the rain coming. Can you hear it? I hear the noise coming. I hear the noise of God's presence coming. Thank you, Lord. Whew. Blow, Spirit. Fill your people. Fill us. Fill us beyond what we've ever been filled before. Mess us up. Lord, we just give you the place. We give you everything. Sweet Jesus, we love you. Thank you, Lord. Kishtani akata makoro toranti. Janti alabakans ti amakoronti. Ishtana makosi na kashtaya. Yen tololo borosh tihi na karai yesorono ko. O ramayata kana mashti. Yen da kastu yoloko stamakaya. Yen tashtu na mokostiara. Ashtiala kahara makai. The throne room of God is coming down. The presence of God is beginning to fill. The Lord is moving. It's a new day. There will be a river flowing through you. There will be streams where it's been dry. The ground will become fertile where it's been unfruitful. Oh, thank you, Lord. Move, Holy Spirit. Bring it, bring it, Lord. Bring your presence, bring it. Right now, I believe God's saying, just right where you are, just lay some things down in your heart. Just lay them down. Just say, God, I'm done with these things. I'm done with things like rejection. I'm done with things like unforgiveness. I'm done with anger. I'm done, I'm done with this stuff that's been holding me back. I'm done with these thoughts. I'm done with this stuff that's agitating. I'm done with this stuff that keeps trying to attack. I'm done. I declare in Jesus' name today that I live in freedom by the Spirit of God, and God is for me, and no one or thing can stand against me because He is my God. Just make a declaration. Just let the Holy Spirit clean house. Oh, come, Jesus, come. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Mm.
I would say some of you right now don't even come out of where you are. Just stay where you are. Some of you need to express whatever's going on by getting out of your seat and coming up to the front and kneeling and just seek the Lord for a moment. I'm, I've already given you permission. Don't wait. Just go ahead and seal this moment before the Lord. <clears throat> prayer team you can come and get behind these people unless you're on your knee well, let's just take a moment oh come come presence of God There's room. You don't have to get up to the front. You just come anywhere up here. Just Some of you need to still move out of where you are and just make an effort. Lord, we bless you. We ask you to continue working even as we leave this place, Lord, that it's not over. Lord, we receive what you've done and we seek you for more. I ask you to visit us even in our homes, visit us in the night watches, visit us over the next days, Lord, and continue to open our eyes to see what we can't see. In the name of Jesus, amen. Anybody else want to come up for prayer? You're welcome to do that. We're going to go ahead and be dismissed. Um, just respect what's happening here for the moment. You can talk and visit.